Check out FlipSideGaming.com for all your gaming needs. Use the promo code HEROES to save 10% on all orders over $10. Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and today we have Throne of Eldraine previews to take a look at. We have a lot of cards to see, so I want to get started pretty quickly. Just as a reminder, if you're curious as to the sources of these preview cards, which content creator previewed each one, check out the description below. Also, if you're looking to pre-order booster boxes of Throne of Eldraine, they do have them at FlipSideGaming.com. You can use that Heroes promo code, save a little cash while you support the channel. That's always appreciated. But without any further ado, let's get into it. Okay, in true Wizards fashion, when they want you to focus on one thing, they throw 80 things at you. So here's the next four standard sets before we actually get to the Throne of Eldraine cards. So our next standard set after Throne of Eldraine is going to be Theros Beyond Death. You see that on the left there. The next one is going to be Ikoria, Layer of Behemoths. That one actually sounds pretty cool. Core Set 2021 will be next summer. That is going to focus on Teferi this time. And finally, Zendikar Rising, which is going to be the old feel of Zendikar, the adventure world, not the Eldrazi world. The Eldrazis are gone now. Okay, let's move on to Throne of Eldraine stuff. We got our first good look at the theme boosters, so I just thought I'd throw that up there. Here's what the collector booster will look like, and it has Garrick on it. That's why they did not show this picture until now. And if you saw the title card, you already know, yes, Garrick is in the set. We'll be getting to him in a little bit. Next, we have some food tokens. Yes, food is going to be a thing in the set. You're going to see that as we get into the cards in just a few moments. They are artifact tokens, food, pay two, tap, sacrifice this artifact, you gain three life. Not super powerful on their own, but they do interact with other cards in the set. And I do think with the right synergies, they could be fun. Okay, our next stop is the Brawl decks, and they showed us all the exclusive new cards to these decks. Now, remember, you can get the exclusive cards either in the particular Brawl decks that they're in, or sometimes in the collector boosters, but the cards that you'll see in this section of the video, you will not find in draft boosters. They are technically standard legal, but they did mention that they are concerned about making them too powerful, much like the exclusive Planeswalker deck cards. They might be a little harder to get a hold of, although the collector booster is a nice touch now that you're able to get them somewhere other than the pre-constructed deck. I do like that, but they are still trying to make them a little bit weaker so that they don't end up seeing standard play. Just a quick note too about the product, it says includes two boosters in this mock-up, but it doesn't appear that they actually do include boosters. Wizards did an unboxing video yesterday and it was just the deck in there, so just wanted to make you aware. And it looks like in the mock-up that they used in that video, they removed the includes two boosters. Now, the first one is Wild Bounty. Chulain Teller of Tales is your featured commander here. That card has already been revealed, and we have spent a lot of time talking about it on the channel, so I don't want to spend more time on it today. But let's get to the other exclusive new cards you're going to find in this deck. The first is Steelbane Hydra. Yeah, nothing crazy here. I mean, obviously, if you had a Commander Hydra build or something like that, this will be perfect. It will fit in there. But other than that, yeah, it will be just fine out of the box if you're playing against the other Brawl decks. Also, too, if you want to try out these Brawl decks against each other, you can do that today on Magic Arena. That's why we got to look at so many cards today. They did have to change out a couple cards here or there because they're multiplayer centric, but for the most part, you can play with the decks right now. Here's the next card, Thorn Mammoth. Again, nothing crazy here. It fights, it's big, it tramples, it's expensive. This is also in the Savage Hunger deck, which we'll look at in a few seconds. Tome of Legends. This one's actually kind of sweet. I mean, it only costs two. It is going to get more powerful as the game goes on the more times that you play your commander. And whenever your commander enters the battlefield or attacks, you get to put a counter on this. Pay one, tap, remove the counter, you can draw a card. So it's not ultra fast or anything like that. But in a long multiplayer game, there's definitely value to be had here. Command Tower. Now this is not a new card. The other cards in this section are brand new. But this had brand new art, so I just wanted to point it out to you. It actually looks kind of sweet. You're going to get one copy of this in each of the four Brawl decks. Here's the second Brawl deck, Knight's Charge. Now, the previous deck, of course, because it was Chulain Teller of Tales, that's a deck that's going to care about things entering the battlefield. This one is a little different. It's a little simpler. This is all about Knight Tribal in the Mardu Colors, which is something that's going to also be found within the set itself. You'll see that in a little bit. Let's look at the exclusive new cards in this deck. Here's the front-facing commander for this one, Sir Gwyn, Hero of Ashvale. Could be good if I wanted to play Knight Tribal and Commander or Brawl, obviously. I do like its interaction with equipment. That actually could be very good in certain builds. And obviously, if you have knights, being able to equip things for no cost is kind of awesome. So 
yeah, this is another really well-designed card, I think, for what it's doing. Mesa the Valiant. This one is actually in a couple decks. You'll also find this in Fairy Schemes, which we'll look at in a few moments. Fine piece of equipment for any Brawl or Commander deck running white and playing a lot of creatures. Silver Wing Squadron. This is kind of interesting because it does care about how many opponents you have. When this attacks, you get 2-2 two, two White Knight tokens with Vigilance based on the number of opponents you have. So this is actually better earlier in the game before people start going out. Now, aside from that, again, it's a very serviceable creature. It's just going to be fine for you in a multiplayer environment. Here's another card that cares about the number of opponents out there, Embereth Skyblazer. This time the bonus is if you pay the mana into this, when it attacks, then this and all your creatures get plus X plus O based on the number of opponents you have. So just one opponent, that's maybe a little underwhelming, but if there's four or five people at the table, yeah, that could be pretty decent. So again, in a white deck or a go-wide strategy and Commander of Brawl, this will be great. Knight's Charge. Okay, so if you have a Knight deck, Commander or Brawl again, yeah, you probably want this card. Three casting cost enchantment. It's going to let you gain a little life, and it also damages all your opponents. Every time a Knight attacks, you gain one life. All your opponents lose a life. So that could add up, obviously, throughout the game, or if you just had a really big turn and attacked with a whole bunch of Knights. And that second part sets you up for later in the game to be able to do that. Okay, this next one is Savage Hunger. This is a Jund deck that likes to sacrifice for benefit. Sounds like Jund. Let's see what we have here. Corvold, Fae, Curse King is your front-facing commander. Whenever this comes into the battlefield or attacks, you sacrifice a permanent. But when you do, it gets a plus one, plus one counter, and you draw a card. And that happens whenever you sacrifice a permanent. So if you have other things that you can sacrifice or other sack outlets, food tokens, for example. This can get pretty powerful pretty quickly and allow you to see more cards. Chittering Witch also cares about the number of opponents you have. When this enters the battlefield, you get to create a number of 1-1 one, one black rat creature tokens based on that number. And you can pay a black and one and sacrifice a creature at any time. It doesn't tap or anything. Target creature will get minus 2, minus 2. But again, more importantly, in this deck, there's more benefits to sacrificing things. Gluttonous Troll is next. And what's kind of cool about this one is it creates food tokens. But a lot of the time, you might not sacrifice the food token for life. You might sacrifice it to this, for example. And if you do, it gets plus two, plus two till end of turn. So it just opens up your options, gives you more things to sacrifice. Or you could just sacrifice those food tokens to get life. And other cards would benefit from that in this deck. Okay, this next one is an Esper Fairies deck, Fairy Schemes. And your front-facing commander here is a Leela Artful Provocateur. Now you'll see from this card, the deck doesn't just care about fairies. It also cares about enchantments and artifacts. And that theme does seem to carry over into the regular set to some degree as well. You'll see that as we go through some of the cards today. Now, other than that, four casting costs, Desperate Colors, and one, two, three. It's a little smaller, but it has a lot going on. Flying, Death Touch, Lifelink, other creatures you control with flying, get plus one, plus oh. Yeah, definitely a commander or brawl deck with a lot of flyers. This will be good, and it will be especially good with fairy strategies. I also like the fact that they have this warlock creature type, too. That's been on a number of cards. You'll see it more today as well. Shimmer Dragon's a little expensive, but it is a big ol' flyer that cares about artifacts and could lead to some card draw for you. Workshop Elder is another expensive card, but again, a strong card for a multiplayer game where you have more mana, you have more resources, you have more time. Basically, artifact creatures you control have flying. That's pretty good, but at the beginning of combat in your turn, you may have target nine creature artifact you control, become a zero zero artifact creature. If you do, put four plus one plus one counters on it, and that is permanent. That will stay that way. So if you have a mana rock, for example, you can just turn that into a creature. That's pretty cool. And remember, it's also going to have flying. So you're going to have yourself a 4-4 flyer. And maybe if you have a way to proliferate or something like that, it could get bigger. Yeah, pretty sweet card overall, again, for these multiplayer games. Next is Banish into Fable. This can create some 2-2 white knight tokens for you with vigilance, but can also bounce target non-land permanents. And it is an instant. Obviously, you want to play this when you control an artifact and an enchantment whenever possible. All right, on to the main event. This information has been coming out quickly, but I believe from everything I pieced together that these are the cards that you will find in draft boosters. There's a couple at the end I wasn't sure about. I'll point those out. This one, all the glitters. Yeah, it's okay. It's a fine limited card. The problem with it is you could get two for one. That's always an issue with some of these enchantments, although this one is cheap, a white and one. I just think it's so board state dependent that I don't know if I'd really want to run this. I would want a fair amount of artifacts and or enchantments before I feel comfortable. 
Shining armor, okay, here's a piece of equipment in white, and it is an artifact, and I do think that will matter. Definitely in the Mardu colors especially, it could be something that you care about in a draft. On its own, though, in a vacuum, it doesn't feel super impressive. If you have knights, wonderful, you can flash it in and kind of use it as a combat trick by adding some defense, and it also gives the knight vigilance if it doesn't already have it, nothing wrong with that. But again, if you don't have other synergies with this type of thing, I don't know if you just run this out of the blue. Silver Flame Ritual. Yeah, this is okay. It's going to be fine for you in Limited. This one is a common at Sorcery Speed. Put a plus one, plus one counter in each creature you control, especially later in the game. If you're going wide and you need to put away the game, that could be just fine for you. And also, it has a new mechanic. It's called Adamant. If at least three white mana was spent to cast this spell, creatures you control gain Vigilance until end of turn. So when it comes to Standard, I'm not feeling it there. Obviously, if you're going to play something like this, you're going to play Unbreakable Formation. The Circle of Loyalty, and this is a very knight-centric legendary artifact here. Little expensive, sure. However, it's cheaper if you have some knights. It's going to cost one less for each knight you control. Could this see standard play? I think it could with everything that's going on. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one, so it has that built-in anthem effect. Whenever you cast a legendary spell, you get to create a 2-2 white knight creature token with vigilance. Okay, that might not happen all the time, but if it happens once or twice during a game, that could be decent. And you can also make a token by paying a white and three. It does tap, though, but still, it gives you the option to do it. If there is a knight standard deck, and it's a little early, obviously, to say if that's going to be viable, then I do think this could see play in it. We are losing some knights from Dominaria, but this set so far seems to be giving us a lot of interesting knights. And there are still good ones out there, like Knight of the Ebon Legion, for example. Venerable Knight, this is cheap, it's aggressive, it's basically your Savannah Lion, so a 2 1 for 1, nothing wrong with that. And who knows, maybe it could see a little standard play if the knight build happens to be more aggressive and less mid rangey. If that's the case, then okay, wonderful. But if not, you might still play this unlimited and be very happy with it for draft or sealed. Next, we have Animating Fairy. Before we get into the card itself, let's talk about that adventure mechanic because this is new. Notice you have a sorcery, or sometimes it's an instant, on the bottom left hand corner of the card, and then the card itself looks like a creature card. So if this is in your hand, it's always going to count as a creature. If it's in your graveyard, it's going to count as a creature, not as a sorcery in this example. Now, here's the trick. When you go to play the card, you have a choice to make. You either play it as a sorcery or a creature. And if you play it as a sorcery, it behaves as a sorcery on the stack, same as if you play a creature. And if you play it as a creature, okay, it goes into the battlefield. In this case, for a blue and two, you get a 2-2 flyer. Okay, it's a wind drake. That's fine for limited, right? But if I chose to use the adventure side, then I would choose to use Bring to Life. If I do that, blue and two, target non-creature artifact you control becomes a 0-0 artifact creature. Put four plus one plus one counters on it. Now, if I choose to use the sorcery side, the card will exile instead of going to the graveyard. And as long as it's exiled because I used it as an adventure, I can then later play it as a creature. It doesn't have to be the same turn. It can be another turn. I can only play it when I could play the creature, though. Obviously, this creature doesn't have flash or anything like that, so I'd have to play it on one of my main phases. But you're basically getting a bonus if you do that. Not only did I get the sorcery to occur, but the creature isn't gone either. Later on, I can still play the creature. In some ways, it feels like a cantrip because you're getting another spell out of the deal. And in some ways, it's more consistent because you're not hitting a land ever, right? You're going to have a creature that will give you board presence. Okay, let's talk about this card individually. I think it's fine for limited. Like I said, the creature portion being a Windrake is just fine. And the ability, it's a little board state dependent, which is why I wouldn't necessarily want to play this in standard. But in limited, it could be good for you, especially in draft if you're able to pick up some equipment or just some other artifacts. Corridor Monitor. Okay, this is a cheap creature. It's an artifact, and it's a 1-4. A lot of times in blue for draft and sealed, you do appreciate those type of stats because... Blue tends to be a little more methodical, a little slower. Sometimes they just need to defend themselves against early attacks while they're building up their control base. And also, if for some reason you weren't main decking this, you could always bring it in against an aggressive matchup. Now, it does more, though, when this enters the battlefield, untapped target artifact or creature you control. So that's kind of nice. I mean, it doesn't have flash or anything, no surprise. But you can give a creature maybe like quasi-vigilance, or you can use an ability on a creature or artifact and then untap that, use it again perhaps. So for the casting cost here, yeah, I do think this will be a fine limited card. This also combos with Splinter Twin, by the way. So maybe in Commander, if you're looking for another way to activate that type of combo, 
you could throw this in there. Fairy Formation. Okay, this is, again is a little expensive for standard, even if a fairy deck got there. But if you're playing Kitchen Table Magic or you're playing Commander in a fairy deck, this could be quite good. Cost 5 for a 5-4 flyer. Pay blue and 3 and you get to create a 1-1 one, one blue fairy creature token with flying and draw a card. That's a good mana sink. It doesn't tap notice. As long as you have mana to do that, you're going to be in good shape. This is going to be a phenomenal card for Drafter Seal 2 if you're lucky enough to open it. Fairy Vandal. This one's interesting. I mean, it has flash. It's a 1-2 with flying. And if you can draw more than one card each turn, it does get a plus 1, plus 1 counter. So that's pretty cool for a 2 casting cost. But it is asking a little bit of you. So we haven't seen the whole set yet. If there's a lot of support for fairies, maybe a standard fairy deck could get there. Perhaps it would be in it. Or maybe, just maybe, you could try this in Simic Flash. However, even after rotation, I think Simic Flash might have some better options in this. The problem is, a lot of times you might play this card, and it's a 1-2 two for 2 with flying. And if you can't draw that second card, it doesn't really do a whole lot for you. And a lot of times in standards, you might be in a situation where you kind of get stuck and you're up against a wall and you need a comeback card. Well, this isn't it. So when it comes to limited, though, this will be just fine for you as long as you have some ways to draw cards in your deck. Frogify. I want to turn something into a frog. Well, here you go. It only costs two. Cheap way to take out a creature that's either really big, maybe has a really good ability you're worried about. This will be good blue removal for you in Drafter Sealed. Blue doesn't always have the really stellar options when it comes to removal, but I think this one is going to be just fine for you. It also takes away other creature types, so if there's like an Anthem effect that's going to buff fairies, for example, then, yeah, you don't have to worry about the creature actually being bigger than a 1-1. One, one. Standard, I'm not really feeling it there, but you never know. I mean, if a deck is mono blue, this could be a sideboard card if it was really, really desperate for some kind of removal. Midnight Clock. Now, this is the extended art version of the card. Remember, extended art versions will only be in the collector booster. You won't find this particular version of the card in the draft booster, but it will have a normal version. Okay, so this is a one-sided Time Twister style effect, which is quite good if you can get there, but you gotta get there. It has the casting cost of Time Twister, a blue and two, but it is an artifact. It also taps for blue mana, so it is a mana rock. You can pay a blue and two to put an hour counter on this. Once you get to the 12th counter, it will go off and you get to exile this and do your Time Twister for just yourself. However, at the beginning of each upkeep, you also get to put an hour counter on this. And that's not just your upkeep, that's any upkeep. Especially in a multiplayer game, that could add up pretty quickly. And this is a great effect. I could see this going into a number of commander decks, for example, or brawl decks. For me, I would be interested in this in my Urza commander build. Run away together. I love that art. That's awesome. It's Quasimodo, I guess. So this is actually kind of a sweet card in this particular set. Here's why. Choose two target creatures controlled by different players. Return those creatures to their owner's hand. Only cost two. It's an instant. So if I'm in a 1v1 game, I have to bounce one of my own things, but I can also bounce my opponent's thing that I need to deal with. That's not a bad deal at instant speed. It allows me to protect one of my creatures if I need to, or maybe I have a creature with a good enters the battlefield effect. But here's what I really like about this card in this set. Adventures. If I have a creature with an adventure on it, let's say I play the adventure, then I play the creature, then I bounce one of my opponent's big creatures that cost a lot to put out there, bounce my creature with the adventure, play the adventure again, play the creature again, that's some value right there. Because of that, maybe the C standard play if adventures are good enough. Aside from that too, this is good in multiplayer games because you could actually target two different people if you want to. It will be great and limited for tempo purposes regardless. Pretty good card. Tomb Raider. I don't know, is that a play on Tomb Raider? Anyway, this is a 1-1 one, one for 3, a blue and 2. It's a fairy flying when this enters the battlefield, draw a card. Yikes. Okay, so again, maybe, maybe if the fairy deck gets there in standard, perhaps you play this, but this is expensive. 3 casting costs for a 1-1 one, one flyer does not feel good. It does replace itself, though. So, because of that, draft your sealed. Yeah, I would probably play it a lot of the time. Because getting board presence, even if it's small board presence in the air like this, and also getting deeper into your deck, that's not bad, even for three mana. So I'll do it. I'll be happy with it. But I don't know if this really crosses over into standard at all. Wishful Merfolk. Wow. Ariel is not happy. So anyway, this one is kind of interesting because it has Defender. It can't attack initially. Blue and one for a 3-2 Defender. But you can pay a blue and one, and it loses Defender, but it becomes a human. So Merfolk players probably glanced at this card and were like, wow, this is incredible. 
And then they realize, wait a minute, it's not a merfolk if I attack with it. This isn't so incredible anymore. So, yeah, I don't know if it's all that great. In limited, though, sure, it's going to be fine for you. It can really gum up the ground, which Blue is going to be interested in a lot of the time. And you know what? If you don't have anything better to do attacking with a 3-2 after you've been able to defend with it a little bit for just two mana, not the worst thing in the world. Witching Well. Here's another card I would definitely throw into my Urza Commander build. This would be very sweet there. For just one mana, first off, with Urza, it will be a mana rock, so that's great. But aside from that, when it enters the battlefield, scry two, pay a blue and three, sacrifice it, draw two cards. It's just doing a lot for one mana, and it's an artifact which is very relevant in this set from what we've seen. So I do think this has a chance at seeing some standard play because of all those reasons. And in limited, this thing is going to be a fantastic common. Like, this could be a relatively high pick common in a draft. Bake into a pie. Okay, the top-down design is for real here. And this is going to be great in Drafter Sealed. It's instant speed removal for two black and two. Destroy target creature. It's unconditional. And you make a food token too, which definitely could have relevance in this set. Even if it doesn't, maybe you can just gain some life at some point. Who knows, if food token strategies become strong enough, maybe this does see some standard play. But at the very least, you know you're going to have a good limited card here. Bell of the Brawl. Okay, so this is a 3-2 for 3. It's a knight with menace. And when this attacks, other knights you control get plus 1 plus 0 till end of turn. So if there is a knight deck that is more aggressive, yeah, maybe the C standard play. Again, it's kind of early to judge, but it has potential anyway. Other than that, good limited card. I don't like 3 twos for 3 normally, but this one has menace and the other ability attached to it, so... Considering I'm going to have probably at least a few knights in my deck, yeah, this will be good. Eye Collector. I was really thinking about this one, and I don't know, I haven't seen the payoff yet for this ability. It has flying, it's a 1-1 one, one for just one. When it deals combat damage to a player, each player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. Okay, so if I want to mill myself or mill my opponent, so you're doing both. So if there's some payoff for either of those things in this set that we haven't seen yet, which is very possible then this becomes a lot better. As it stands now, I don't really think it's doing enough, even for Drafter Sealed, but it's kind of early to evaluate this one. It is a fairy, so pay attention to that. Perhaps this will make a little more sense as we see more cards. Falmire Knight. Okay, on the left side, you see the regular copy of the card. On the right side, you're going to see the showcase copy of the card. Remember, showcase copies will be found in the collector boosters, but they can also show up in the regular draft booster too. We don't know at what ratio, but you can get them there. There's one exception to that though. Common non-foil ones will only be found in the collector booster. Okay, so let's talk about this card. It's cheap and only costs one. This is a one casting cost, one one death touch creature, which I play a lot of times in Drafter Sealed and I'm pretty happy with them. But this also has an adventure attached to it. It's an instant profane insight for a black and two. Let's you draw a card and you lose one life. Okay, sure, so basically for 2 black and 2, I get a 1-1 one, one death touch creature and it replaces itself. That feels like a pretty good limited card to me. And also, it's a zombie knight, especially that knight portion could be very, very relevant. Again, depending on the knight tribe, this maybe does see some standard play. It just kind of depends on if that deck can get there and what it looks like. But again, regardless, you'll be happy to play this, at least in the limited formats. Order of Midnight, some more night action here. This one is going to be a 2-2 with flying for a black and two, but it can't block. You know what? If you want to be aggressive, there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Those are fantastic stats on their own. But wait, there's more. Alter Fates is a sorcery adventure. Black and one, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So you have that option a little bit later in the game or middle of the game to get a creature back from the graveyard to your hand, and then for two more, get this flyer. Yeah, it's not going to protect you if you're getting beat down, sure, but it might be able to let you get that card out of the graveyard, which is, again, going to be card advantage for you. And for two black and two, the economy feels pretty good. It's a knight again. Same thing as the last card. Maybe it could see standard play under the right circumstances in the meta, but definitely something I'd be interested in for Drafter Sealed. Piper of the Swarm. Okay, so this one is for your rat fans out there. Unfortunately, I don't know if there's going to be much to do with this in Standard, and it is a little bit slow, too. It's a 2 casting cost 1-3, rats you control on Menace, but to create a rat with this, you have to pay a black and one and tap it. And then if you sacrifice three rats, but you also have to pay two black and two and tap, gain control target creature. Well, that's not bad, but it's going to take a little work to get there. Unless, again, there's a number of rats we just don't know about, which is maybe possible at this point, because we have a lot of cards to see. So, in a vacuum, on its own, 
probably wouldn't play it in Draft Your Sealed, but I have a suspicion that maybe next week or the week after we'll see more cards that interact with this, and it could get a lot better. When it comes to Commander, though, if I want to build around this a little bit, it could be good there. Rankle, Master of Pranks. This one is a Mythic Rare, and it is a Fairy Rogue. It's Legendary, too, so this could be your Commander. I actually think this could be a great Commander card, because the ability here impacts all players. So here's my problem with it in a 1v1 matchup, though. 3-3 three, three for 4, Flying Haste. I do like those stats. Now let's say I get this out on turn 4. I attack in. My opponent can't block it. I do 3 damage. That's pretty good. I can choose to do any number of these reciprocal effects, including 0. If I don't think I'm going to benefit from these triggers, I don't use them, and I just have a 3-3 three, three Haste Flyer. If that's the case, you're not getting the true value out of the card, though. Let's take a look at the abilities. Each player discarding a card. That could be bad for you, too. Each player loses a life and draws a card. Giving your opponents cards, especially when one of your strong cards is a creature card. You're just asking for them to find an answer for it. And then each player sacrifices a creature again. Hopefully you have something you can throw away, or that ability might not be that great either. I love the fact that this gives you the option to do all three if you want. That could be a pretty big hit. But under a lot of circumstances, you might not be able to do those things and feel comfortable. So there are ways to mitigate it, sure. I just don't know how consistent that would be in Standard. Commander or Brawl, like I said, I'd love to try it out there. This one's Smitten Swordmaster. This is a good common knight, I think, for your limited games. If you can draft a lot of knights, that sorcery adventure could be quite good. It only costs one black. Gain X life. Each opponent loses X life, where X is the number of knights you control. And the creature side is a 2-1 lifelinker for 2. When it comes to standard, though, this is just too board dependent. If you don't have a lot of knights out, that sorcery adventure isn't doing a whole lot for you. And a 2-1 lifelinker for 2 isn't all that impressive. If you have maybe some anthem effects, wonderful. But again, you're relying on board state to get there. Like I said, though, Drafter Sealed, it could be fine with that ability as long as you have a lot of knights. Some formats, a 2-1 lifelinker for 2 is good. Other formats, it's not very good. It just kind of depends on the speed of the formats. Sir Conrad the Grim. Okay, this to me is more of a commander card or maybe a brawl card. Standard, yeah, this does interact with Eye Collector, but like I said about Eye Collector, I want to see more cards that are going to be good enough in Standard that care about this type of thing. If they can get there, then wonderful, maybe this does see Standard play. But as it stands right now, I just want to kind of play this in a multiplayer format. Here's why. Whenever another creature dies or a creature card is put into a graveyard from anywhere other than the battlefield, or a creature card leaves your graveyard, this will deal one damage to each opponent. So if you can start juggling creatures, or kill a lot of creatures, or mill creatures into graveyards, what have you, you could be doing a lot of damage to the entire table. And this has a built-in way to help you because it has this black and one. Each player puts the top card of their library into their graveyard. So you're able to try to push that top effect a little bit. And you're also milling everybody, which might not be a bad thing either. I would be interested in trying to build around this as a commander, or maybe put it in a Muldrotha build and kind of see how it plays there. Taste of Death. It's an okay limited card. It's a rare. Not my favorite type of removal, though. If I'm paying this much, each player sacrifices three creatures, and then I get to create three food tokens. All right. So I like the flavor here. Definitely awesome top-down design. However, you're letting the opponent choose what they sacrifice, and especially when you get to the point where you're playing this for six, they might have a lot of creatures that are obsolete if you're in a board stall or something like that. Now, sure, it could turn the tide some of the time, but each player sacrifices three creatures, so you have to do it as well if you can. Now, if you're really behind and you have no creatures left and you're about to lose or something, then this could be awesome. And there's nothing wrong with food tokens. Like I said, it looks like there's going to be other synergies other than just gaining life. So I don't think this is a bad card by any means, but don't expect it to always save you if you're behind. Crystal Slipper. Enchanted Creature gets plus one, plus oh, and has haste, so you get to equip it for just one. Yeah, this is fine for limited and an aggressive build. If you have a lot of small creatures, you're trying to push across damage quickly. You don't want to dilute your deck too much with stuff like this, but like one copy of this, it's a common. You should be able to pick it up even later in a draft, probably. Could do a little work for you. Emberath Paladin. This might see some limited play, but it's not always going to make your cut. 4-1 with haste for 5, but if I was able to pay at least 3 red mana in this casting cost, then it comes in with a plus 1, plus 1 counter. Here's what I don't like about this. If I pay the mana, sure, I might be able to surprise my opponent, but this is also going to trade for a 2-drop a lot of the time. That's not going to feel very good, right, for what you're putting into this. 
Now, granted, it is a knight. There could be other synergies. I do think there are decks that do play this, but I don't think it's the best knight we've seen. I just have a hard time with those stats, honestly, considering the casting cost. And Breath Shieldbreaker. I like this one a lot for limited because you get a 2-1 for 2, which isn't amazing for stats, but it is a knight, which definitely could be applicable to what's going on in the set. And also, you have the Sorcery Adventure destroy target artifact for just one red. So you're able to not have to worry about sideboarding something in necessarily. This is something you can main deck. And it feels like you're going to come across a fair amount of artifacts from what we've seen today. So yeah, I'd be happy to main deck this. Even if I'm not into like a heavy Mardu Knights deck or something like that. I do think this is good enough to protect me against some artifacts in game one. Slaying Fire. Okay, I think this could see some standard play. Here's the deal. We're used to Lightning Strike, right? Three to any target for red and one. But with the adamant ability here and a mono red deck, doesn't feel that bad. Three casting costs to do four damage to any target. Okay, it's not Lava Coil. Lava Coil is going to be something that a lot of decks are still going to want to deal with certain creatures. But if I'm trying to burn out my opponent and I need the flexibility, I might run a copy or two of this. Also, in limited, obviously, it will be great in Drafter Sealed. Beanstalk Giants. Okay, this one is actually decent for limited. Better in some decks than others. I really want to play this more so if I'm getting greedier with colors. Notice the adventure here. It's a sorcery, green and two, fertile footsteps. Search your library for a basic land card. Put it onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. It does not come into play tapped. So on turn three, I can maybe fix some color. And if that's important to me, wonderful. Even ramps me a little. Later in the game, now I have this option to maybe get a 7-7 creature or perhaps it's even bigger. It doesn't have trample. It doesn't have evasion, sure, but you know what? Sometimes in Drafter Sealed, a big old creature is good enough. So yeah, I'll play it there and be relatively happy with it. If I'm a little more stable on color, like a two-color evenly split deck, then I would probably skip it. Flex and Intruder. Here's Goldilocks and the Three Bears. This one's just okay for me. Like if I pay a green, I get the one-two creature. If it deals combat damage to a player, I may sacrifice it. If I do, then I get to destroy target artifact or enchantment. Okay, now the problem with that is a 1-2 doing combat damage to a player. The stars have to line up pretty precisely for that to ever happen. And then you still have to sacrifice the creature, which is kind of awkward too. Not that it might matter that much, it's just a 1-2. So okay, now the adventure side is a sorcery, 2 green and 5 for 3 two, 2 green bear creature tokens. I don't know, y'all. I think when you get to the point where you're playing 2 green and 5, 3 creature tokens is going to feel a little underwhelming. Again, we haven't seen the rest of the set. Maybe there's payoffs for this type of thing. But I don't know. I'm not feeling this one. It doesn't feel that strong to me, even in the world of Drafter Sealed. Maybe sideboarding it in if I lost to an enchantment or an artifact and I don't have a lot of better options. But yeah, I don't see myself main decking this, honestly. Gilded Goose. This is not bad. It might see a little standard play now that Lanoir Elves is rotating out to give some decks a quick start. It also color fixes and is better with other cards that create food tokens. This will be good in Draft and Sealed too, because like I said, it does color fix and also ramps you a little bit. Pretty good rare if you're lucky enough to get this in Limited. Keeper of Fables. The ability is pretty good here. Whenever one or more non-human creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, draw a card. Nothing wrong with that. If you have trample creatures, evasive creatures, this card will be fantastic in Draft or Sealed. A 4-5 for 5 though that does nothing on its own isn't going to be good enough for standard. It is a cat though for you cat fans out there. Love Struck Beast. It's Beauty and the Beast. That's pretty cool. So this one actually has a pretty good economy behind it, I think. Let's say I just play the creature. Green and two for a 5-5. Five, five. It can attack, though, unless I control 1-1 one, one creature, but it can still block. That's not too bad, especially if I have a lot of ways to create 1-1 one, one tokens, or I have some 1-1 one, one creatures in my deck. Now, the adventure helps you get there with a 1-1 one, one creature. So on turn one, in theory, what I could do is go ahead and play the sorcery, get the 1-1 one, one white human creature token, Hopefully it survives. Turn three, I play this. By turn four, I'm attacking in with a 5-5. Five, five. That feels pretty good. Maybe even standard playable good. Definitely awesome and limited. Rose Thorn Acolyte. Good limited common. Not a lot to say about this one. Green and two. If I just play it as a creature, two, three. Mana Dork gives me a man of any color. It's going to fix me, ramp me. Nothing wrong with that. The Sorcery Adventure is all about early fixing, add one mana of any color, but it costs one green to do that, so you're just filtering your green mana into another color. Might be important some of the time, but like I said, the creature is good enough to play in Drafter Sealed and be pretty happy with. 
Arcanus Owl. Okay, this is an artifact creature for hybrid mana. Definitely feels like we're going to Theros pretty soon, right? Because, like I said at the top of the video, they revealed that. It wasn't really a big surprise if you've been paying attention to what's been going on in design over the last couple sets. So this will be a great devotion card, perhaps. But for right now, okay, maybe if I really, really care about artifacts or enchantments in this current standard, perhaps it sees some standard play. But honestly, I do think forecasting cost is a lot to ask for an ability like this, especially considering you could very well miss. Because of that, I think this is more of a limited card. In Drafter Sealed, if I miss, I don't think it's the end of the world, right? Because I still got a 3-3 flyer. And if I hit, wonderful. All right, Fireborn Knight. It doesn't really look like this, by the way, with the flames. That was just the way the card was revealed. But anyway, another card with High Devotion. Human Knight, 2-3, Double Strike. And you can pay 4 Hybrid Mana, Boros Colors, to give this plus 1, plus 1 to the end of turn. All right, good limited card again for Knights. Definitely, if I'm drafting a lot of them. Maybe, maybe it could get there in standard. Again, if you have a knight deck that's really pushed and it's more aggressive, this could be a higher end drop for that deck, perhaps. But at this casting cost, it is asking a little bit. Garrick Cursed Huntsman. He makes it into the set. On your left side, you see the regular version. On the right side, you see the full art copy, which can be found in collector boosters, but could also be found in draft boosters. Not sure what the ratio is, but it could happen. I'll cut to the chase here. I do think this card is standard playable considering we're going into a standard post rotation. We're getting pared down. There's not as many cards to choose from anymore. And considering this costs six, that's a little bit high, but it does do some good things. It protects itself really well with the zero, creating two 2-2 two, two black and green wolf creature tokens. And when they die, or when any of them dies, put a loyalty counter on each Garrick you control. So basically, that's the only way to get loyalty on Garrick. But it also puts loyalty on other Garricks, which is kind of cool, maybe for commander purposes, right? Or Oathbreaker. Now, the second ability also protects it. Destroy target creature, and you get to draw a card. That's not bad at all. And the minus six, sure, that can be game winning as long as you have some creatures behind you. And hopefully, if you're playing green and black, you do. Just seems like it could be kind of tough to deal with Garrick if you don't have an answer pretty quickly. And once those wolf tokens start piling up and then eventually your opponent has a weird decision to make, do I kill the wolf token? Do I take the damage? If I block and kill it, then Garrick gets loyalty. Puts them in a really tough spot, actually. I like that a lot. So like I said, I do think this could see standard play maybe in a few different types of builds, as a matter of fact. And in limited, of course, it's a mythic. It should be a bomb. It is a bomb. Inspiring Veteran. We're losing Banalish Marshall, of course, with rotation. This isn't quite as good, but for two casting costs, two different colors, you get a 2-2. Two, two. Other knights you control get plus one, plus one. Again, in standard, if you have an aggressive knight build out there, this is probably part of it. In limited, this will be great. Even with just a few knights, you're going to get your money's worth here for sure. Marleaf Pixie. Here's a fairy in Simic colors. 2-2 two, two flyer for just two, and it taps for green or blue. This could show up in a standard fairy deck, perhaps, if one can get there. And also remember, in this standard season, Simic decks, Bant decks have been very, very good. So yeah, maybe post-rotation, this could get adopted into some sort of variation on one of the decks we've already seen. Yeah, I do think it has a good chance to see play somewhere. And in limited, this is fantastic. It ramps you, color fixes, and it's a nice evasive creature that's cheap. Oko Thief of Crowns. I mentioned this one earlier because this is an efficient way to create food tokens. On the left, you see the regular copy. On the right, you see the full art copy. Here's what I like about it. Blue, green, and one. Four loyalty, plus two, create a food token. On turn three, you could have a six loyalty planeswalker. So what do you do with this thing other than create food tokens? Well, the plus one's even good. Target artifact or creature loses all abilities and becomes a green elk creature with power and toughness 3-3. Very versatile. You could use that on one of your opponent's artifacts or creatures that have a good ability you're worried about, or shrink down a big creature. Or use it on one of your things if you maybe had a 1-1 one, one creature, you could bulk it up to a 3-3 three, three elk, for example. The minus 5 is actually pretty intriguing because you can do it quickly. Exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target creature and opponent controls with power 3 or less. But remember, if you drop this on turn 3, did the plus 2, you got 6 loyalty. On turn 4, you can minus 5 this, give them one of those food tokens, and take a small creature. That actually could really shift the game pretty significantly, especially in sealed or draft. Maybe later in the game this isn't quite as impressive, but I do think that plus one is always going to be beneficial. And if you have other uses for the food tokens, 
this could be good. I think this does see standard play because of all the reasons I mentioned. And again, you got another Mythic Planeswalker that, surprise, surprise, is a bomb and limited. Savvy Hunter. Definitely feels like Jun cares about sacrificing things, and this is going to be pretty good for you in limited. Three casting costs 3-3 three, three, Human Warrior. When this attacks or blocks, you get to create a food token, sacrifice two foods, draw a card. Okay, so again, if you had a card like the previous one that is allowing you to create a lot of food tokens, this gets better. But even on its own, it's pretty good. The stats are good. When it attacks or blocks, it doesn't have to damage an opponent or anything like that to get the food token. And it has card draw built in when you sacrifice these tokens. This might even see some standard play if you have a deck that cares about this type of thing that is good enough. Shine Chaser. This one's a fairy, but this is more of a limited card for me. And I don't even know if I always play this in my Drafter Sealed decks. Flying Vigilance 1-1, one, one, if I have a way to buff fairies or if I have things that care about fairies, wonderful. But you're paying three for this. It gets plus one, plus one if you have an artifact and plus one, plus one if you have an enchantment. But that is very board dependent. And depending on how your draft goes or how your seal pool looks, you could just have better things. This does get better, though, if you have strong auras and equipment, and that's when I would consider it. Steel Claw Lance, this to me is another card for limited purposes. Good with knights, obviously. Being able to equip this for just one is great. Equipping it for three isn't bad either, especially if you can put it on, say, a trample creature or a creature with evasion. These type of cards are typically pretty good. I like the fact that it buffs toughness, too. Many times these cards only buff power. So it isn't uncommon. Grabbing one of these for draft or playing one of these out of the seal pool, I think, could be good sometimes. Wintermore Commander, another limited card for me, just because it's so board state dependent. In limited, if I paid two for this and I got a 2-1 Death Touch creature, like that's good enough. But that's not good enough in standard, obviously. The abilities here are good if you have knights. Obviously, this would be better in draft probably than sealed, but very playable. And definitely the more knights you have, the better it will be. Golden Egg. This plays well with Gilded Goose, I guess, which we saw earlier. So this is a two casting cost artifact food, kind of like the food tokens. When it enters the battlefield, you draw a card, so it replaces itself. I like that. Pay one, tap and sack to add one mana of any color. So, okay, it fixes color for limited purposes. So it kind of acts like a food token in that capacity. The card is kind of underwhelming right now. Like I said, it's great that it replaces itself for Drafter Sealed. If I really care about color fixing, I could run this. But I do think we're going to see more cards that care about food tokens being in play or artifacts being in play or just simply maybe sacrificing things, especially in junk colors as time goes on. So this card might feel a lot better in a week or two. Heraldic Banner. This is a mana rock that lets you choose a color and it boosts your creatures of that color's power. The mana it provides will be the same color you choose. Yeah, that doesn't feel horrible for three mana. Maybe because the standard play in like a mono white aggro deck, something like that, perhaps. If not, though, good and limited. It's a mana rock that's going to give you a little bit of upside. For the cost of three, that feels pretty good. This could also be good in Commander or definitely Brawl. Shambling Suits. Okay, for limited, I think this is fine. It's nothing too exciting, but here's a card that cares about those food tokens in play or other artifacts and equipment. This is another card that may be a little better with auras and equipment especially. So that could be very relevant, especially maybe more so in draft than sealed. Now, other than that though, doesn't have evasion, doesn't have trample. So I do think many times it still might not make the cut in limited for me. Do you like top down design? Do you like food tokens? Well, I got the card for you, which is Oven. So this is a cheap way to make food tokens at the expense of your creatures. How important will sacrificing these tokens be? How important will sacrificing creatures be? How important will the food tokens themselves be? We just don't know yet for me to say whether this is a great card for Drafter Sealed or even for Standard for that matter. So I do think we're going to get an idea as to how powerful these type of cards are in the coming days and weeks. Thornwood Falls. Okay, so this is one I'm not sure if it's actually going to be in the regular set or not, or if it's just going to be in the Brawl deck. This does have a symbol for Throne of Eldraine, but it also has new art, so maybe they put the symbol on just because it does have new art, kind of like Command Tower. If it is in the set, then wonderful, you got a way to mana fix for a limited and gain a little life. Tournament Grounds. Okay, if that Mardu Knight deck can get there in standard, this card will definitely be there. What's cool, too, is we're seeing more artifacts and equipment that will cost colors, and that's going to be a trend going forward, they said. So, yes, it is relevant that you could get a color mana for your equipment spell as well as the knights. Especially in sealed, because my seal pool, maybe I don't have a ton of knights, but take the knights I have, combine that with some colored equipment, 
perhaps now this will be worth my time. Also, multiplayer formats, Commander, Brawl, this will be good if you're playing Knights there too. Windsguard Crag, okay, so another card that might be just in the Brawl and Collector Booster Packs, but if not, if it is part of the set after all, then yeah, it could be useful. It does have new art like Thornwood Fall, so maybe that's why they put the Throne of Eldraine symbol on it. Which is Cottage. I really like the design here. I want to see more of this type of thing. This is a non-basic land, but it is a swamp, so it is fetchable. Now, you do have to be playing some other swamps for it to be good, because when this enters the battlefield untapped, which means you have to control three or more other swamps, then you may put target creature card from your graveyard on top of your library. Okay, so in limited, that can be very good for you. You have to be devoted to black enough, but if you are, yeah, this could be a great card. Commander, sure, as long as you're playing enough swamps, you could use a fetch land, go get this, and you have an ability. Not an amazing ability, necessarily, but it's doing something for free. Nothing wrong with that. Even in standard, I do think it could see play there. Wouldn't it be shocked to see a mono black Dread Presence deck do well this season? If that's the case, this card will definitely be in it. Okay, Arena did show the basic lands, but they were kind of dark because I don't own any of them, so you might have to turn the brightness up a little bit to see the art. But here are the planes. Here's your islands. The swamps. Here are the mountains. And there's the four forests. All right, that wraps up the first group of previews. If we get more this week, we will recap them for you. If not, though, Saturday, no matter what, we will be back with our Market Watch video as we do every Saturday. But until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon and have a great day.